All right, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to find particular solutions of indefinite integrals. And let's start by looking at this indefinite integral right here. We have the integral of two x dx and we wanna find the solution to that, right? So we would use the power rule for integration and we would have that this is equal to two times x to the power of one plus one divided by one plus one, right? We added one to our power of one and then divided by that power. And then of course, we can't forget to add that plus C, which represents any constant that might be added to this function. And so if we were to simplify this, we would have that this is equal to two times X squared divided by two plus C. And so then of course these twos would cancel and we would be left with the answer of X squared plus C. And so this is what we call the general solution for an indefinite interval. And we call it the general solution because it represents a ton of different possibilities of what the answer to this integral could be, right? When you were taking the integral of a function, you were trying to find a result or a function whose derivative is inside this integral, right? Because if you took the derivative of x squared, you would multiply your exponent down and then subtract one from the exponent to be left with 2x, which is what we have over here. And then of course, the derivative of a constant c is just zero. And so this is the general solution to this integral because it represents all the different functions that could have this derivative, right? So not only does x squared itself have the derivative of 2x, but so does x squared plus three or x squared minus 50 or x squared plus the square root of 15,329, right? No matter what constant you add to this x squared, when you take the derivative of each of these functions, this constant, the derivative of it is just going to be zero. And so really you're just going to have the derivative of this first term here, this x squared, which will be two x. And so that's why we have this C here. This C represents all these possible constants that could be added to our function, such that the function still has a derivative of two x. But the question is, what if we wanted to find a particular solution or a function that has a particular value of C? And so if we backtrack a little bit here, what if we wanted to find the solution to this integral, given that we knew that its solution crosses through the point one, five, or you could interpret this as for your answer y evaluated at one, it's going to be equal to five, right? Whatever the solution is to this indefinite integral, we want it to pass through this point one, five. And so how do we go about finding that? Well, remember what we said about this integral, we said that the answer was equal to x squared plus C. And so then this would be our function y, right? This is the function whose derivative is inside this integral. And we want this function to pass through this point one five, where when it's evaluated at one, it's equal to five. And so if we were to plug one into this function and set it equal to five, we would be able to solve for this value of C. So if we do that, we'll have that five is equal to one squared plus C, right? We plugged our X value of one into this X squared term and we set our function equal to five because Y would be equal to five. And so now if we solve for C in this case, we'll have that five is equal to one plus C and we'll have that C is equal to four. And so now that we know that C is equal to four, we can rewrite our original answer here to be Y equals X squared plus four we now have a particular solution to this integral. Our function here still has a derivative of two X, but now we have a specific value of C given this information up here, which we call the initial condition. And so now that you've seen the process or an example of how to find a particular solution, let's look at some more examples of how we would find particular solutions for some different scenarios. All right, so here we have the indefinite integral, three times the quantity X squared minus one third DX, and we have this initial condition here that our answer y when evaluated at two should be equal to five. And so if we were to go through and evaluate this integral, we'll start by pulling out this three. So I have that this is equal to three times the integral of x squared minus one third and then dx. And then if we go through the integration process, we'll have that this is going to be equal to three times and we'll have x to the power of two plus one divided by two plus one, that's using our power rule for integration, and then we'll subtract one third x, right? Whenever you have a constant and you take the integral of it, you just multiply it by x. And then we don't wanna to forget to add c. All right, so then if we simplify our answer here, we'll have that this is equal to three times 
x to the third power divided by three minus one third x, and then we have plus c. And then if we distribute this three to each part of this quantity, we'll have that this is equal to x cubed, right? This three and this three will cancel out. And actually that's gonna happen over here for this term too. We're gonna have this three and this three cancel out because it's three divided by three, which is just one. And so then we're gonna have minus x, and then we still have our plus c term here. So we'll have plus c. And so this would be our general solution. If we were just asked to solve this indefinite integral without this initial condition, we would be done. This would be the answer to this integral. But we have this initial condition here that we want our answer when evaluated at two to be equal to five, right? So this would actually be our function y. And so if we were to plug two into this function, and set it equal to five, we can then solve for c. And so I'll do that over here. We'll have that five is equal to two cubed minus two plus c, right? We plug two in for each x in our general solution. So we had two cubed and then minus two, which matches up with this minus x here. And then we set it equal to five, which is what y is equal to. And so then if we solve for c here, we'll have that five is equal to eight, right? Two cubed is equal to eight and minus two plus C. And so then we'll have that five is equal to six plus C. And then if we subtract this six from both sides, we'll have that C is equal to negative one. And so now we know what C is equal to given this initial condition. And so we can plug it in to our general solution to then have our particular solution that Y equals X cubed minus X minus one. And so this would be our final answer or our particular solution for this indefinite integral given this initial condition. Let's look at another example. So here we have a different way of presenting the same question. Here we have that the derivative of some function f of x is equal to six x squared. And then we have our initial condition here that the function evaluated at zero is equal to negative two. And we wanna find the function f of x. And so this might seem a little confusing at first because well, where is our indefinite integral? We don't see it, right? We're not given an integral in this case. But remember what we know about indefinite integrals, that whatever we are taking the integral of, we are looking to find a function whose derivative is in that integral. So if we are looking to find f of x, and we know that the derivative is equal to six x squared, then if we integrate the derivative, we will get our function. And so we're gonna have that f of x, the function we are looking for will be equal to the integral of six x squared dx. And so if we go through and solve this integral, we'll have that this is equal to six times x to the power of two plus one divided by two plus one and then plus c. And then if we simplify, we'll have that this is equal to six times x to the third power divided by three. And then don't forget your plus c. And then six divided by three is equal to two. So our answer here is that this is equal to two x cubed plus c. And so this is our general solution for f of x, but now we need to find a particular solution given that our function, when evaluated at zero, needs to be equal to negative two. And so let's plug zero into this function and then set it equal to negative two and solve for c. And so if we do that, we'll have that negative two is equal to two times zero cubed plus c. And so now if we evaluate this, we'll have that zero cubed is zero, so zero times two is also zero. So this is completely eliminated, and so we are just left with c equal to negative two. And so now we found our value of c, and so if we were to plug that back into our general solution for this c right here, we will have that f of x is equal to two x cubed minus two. And so this would be our final answer, or our particular solution, for this scenario. And so hopefully that made sense that even though we weren't given an indefinite integral to start with, we can still solve the problem using our knowledge about what the integral represents, right? That the function on the inside is the derivative of the function we are trying to find. All right, let's look at another example. All right, so this example is going to build off of our previous example. There's going to be a little bit more work involved with this one, but I think you're gonna be able to follow along here. So we are given that g double prime of x or the second derivative of some function g of x is equal to two. The first derivative of that function evaluated at two is equal to five and the original function evaluated at two is equal to 10 and we wanna find that original function g of x. And so this is a little bit different, right? We are starting with a second derivative rather than a first derivative. And so that seems a little confusing but it's not too bad once you realize that this is just going to involve 
two integrals. We are going to need to integrate twice, right? Because how would we normally get to a second derivative of a function? Well, we would need to take the derivative of the original function two times. We would take the derivative once to find the first derivative, and then we would take the derivative again to find the second derivative. And so what we're gonna to need to do here is the opposite, the reverse of that process. We are going to integrate the second derivative to find the first derivative, and then we'll integrate the first derivative to find the original function. And so thankfully we are given an initial condition for that first derivative, so we can actually find the particular solution of that first derivative, which we can then use to find our original function, which also has an initial condition. And so let's go through this step by step. Let's look at how we are going to approach this problem using what we know about integrals. And so we'll start by finding the first derivative g prime of x, right? That's going to be equal to the integral of g double prime of x, our second derivative, which is two, and then we have dx. And so let's integrate this integral. It should be pretty easy because we know that the integral of a constant is just equal to that constant times x. And so we'll have that this is going to be equal to 2x plus c. But now we wanna find out what this c is equal to, right? If this is equal to g prime of x, and we know that g prime of two is equal to five, then we can set this equal to five, plug in two, and solve for c. So we'll have that five is equal to two times two plus c, right? We plugged in two for this x and set our derivative equal to five. And so now if we solve for c, we'll have that five is equal to four plus c. And if we subtract this four from both sides, we'll have that c is equal to one, right? Five minus four is equal to one. And so now here's a little thing that I forgot to do that I wanna make sure that you don't forget to do. And that is that since we're going to be taking two integrals, we're going to have two different values of C that we're gonna be working with. And so because of this, you need to give these C's a subscript. And so each of these C's, we are going to label with a subscript of one, right? This is going to be C sub one. This is our first value of C because we're going to have a second value of C when we go to find our original function. And so since we know that c sub one is equal to one, we can plug that into our general solution. And so we know that the derivative is equal to two x plus one. This is g prime of x. And so if I clean up some of our work here, we now have that our first derivative is equal to two x plus one. Now let's find our original function g of x. And so we'll have that g of x is equal to the integral of g prime of x, right? This is the derivative of the function we're looking for. So if we integrate it, we will find that original function. So we'll have two x plus one and a dx. And so now if we go through and solve this integral, we'll have that this is equal to two times x to the power of one plus one divided by one plus one plus the integral of one, which would be one times x. So we'll just have x and then plus c. And so now here's the important part. We need a subscript of two because this is our second value of c. So don't forget to add that little subscript because that's going to help you identify which c is which. And so then if we simplify this, we'll have that this is equal to two times x squared divided by two plus x plus c sub two. And then these twos will cancel, right? We'll have two divided by two, which is equal to one. And so what we actually have here is just x squared, which I will write in here, we'll have x squared. And so g of x is equal to this function. We have our general solution for g of x. But now we need to find our value of c sub two. And thankfully we have this initial condition up here that we can use to help us find that. We know that our function g of x evaluated at two is equal to 10. So if we set this function equal to 10 and plug in two, then we will have the following. We'll have that 10 is equal to two squared plus two plus c sub two. And then if we simplify, we'll have 10 equal to four plus two plus c sub two. And then we'll have that 10 is equal to six plus c sub two. And if we subtract six from both sides, we will have that c sub two is equal to four. And so that means that our particular solution here for g of x will be this function and then plug in four for c sub two. So we'll have that g of x is equal to x squared plus x plus four. This is our solution in this case. This is g of x or the particular solution of g of x given this second derivative. Let's look at one more final example for this video. 
All right, so for our last example, we're going to revisit a concept that we learned earlier in calculus where we looked at rates of change, or more specifically, the position function and the velocity function. And then when we looked at higher order derivatives, we also looked at the acceleration function. And so before we go through this problem, let's just recall that if you have a position function s of t, the derivative s prime of t is equal to the velocity function v of t. And if you take another derivative s double prime of t or the derivative of the velocity function, that's equal to the acceleration function, right? The acceleration function is the second derivative of the position function or the first derivative of the velocity function. And so that's important to remember when we go through this problem. So here we have that if the acceleration function is a of t equal to negative 10, what are the velocity and position functions given these two initial conditions, right? Where the velocity function at time equals two is equal to 40, and the position function at t equals zero is equal to 50. And so this is very similar to the last example we did, where we started with a second derivative, right? The acceleration is the second derivative of the position function, and we have two different initial conditions, one for each function that we're going to want to find. And so let's start by taking the integral of our acceleration function to go back to our velocity function. So I have that the velocity function v of t is equal to the integral of the acceleration function, which is negative 10. So we'll have negative 10 dt, right? The variable of integration here is t because all of our functions are defined with t, right? Not x. And so this will be equal to negative 10 times t plus c sub one. Right, we're going to have two values of c because we're going to be taking the integral of two functions here. We're taking the integral of our acceleration function, and then we're going to take the integral of our velocity function to find our original position function. So we're gonna have two values of c that we'll be working with, so it's important that we label each of them accordingly. And then in case you weren't following, the integral of negative 10, which is a constant, will be negative 10 times that variable that we are integrating with respect to, and so it's just gonna be negative 10 times t. And so now we have the general solution to our velocity function, but let's use our initial condition to find that value of c sub one. So we have that our velocity function evaluated at two is equal to 40. So we'll have that 40 is equal to negative 10 times two plus c sub one, right? We took our velocity function, set it equal to 40 and plugged in two. So we'll have that 40 is equal to negative 20 plus c sub one. And if we add 20 to both sides, we will have that c sub one is equal to 60. And so now we can rewrite our general solution to have a particular solution that the velocity function is equal to negative 10 t plus 60. And so now if we clean up our work, we now know that our velocity function is equal to negative 10 t plus 60. And so now if we take the integral of this function, we will move back to our position function. So now we'll have that s of t is equal to the integral of negative 10 t plus 60. And then again, we are integrating with respect to t. And so then if we take the integral of this function, we will have that this is equal to negative 10 times t to the power of one plus one divided by one plus one plus 60 times t. And then we'll have our plus c sub two, right? This is our second value of c. So we're going to label that with a subscript of two. And so then let's simplify this. Notice that we'll have t squared divided by two, and we have negative 10 times that quantity. So if we divide negative 10 by two, then this will be equal to negative five t squared plus 60 t plus c sub two. And so now we have a general solution for our position function. And so now let's use this initial condition for our position function to find c sub two. And so in this case, we'll set our position function equal to 50 and then plug in zero. So we'll have that 50 is equal to negative five times zero squared plus 60 times zero plus C sub two. And so now each of these terms is being multiplied by zero. So they're going to be eliminated. They're just equal to zero. And so all we're left with is that C sub two is equal to 50. And so I'll write that here. C sub two is equal to 50. And so then we can rewrite our general solution here and we'll have our particular solution that the position function s of t is equal to negative five t squared plus 60 t plus 50. And so then this would be your final answer to this problem. All right, so that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more example problems, I'll have an example video linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I have for now. So I will see you next time.